You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome back to Music Tectonics. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa. I'm the CEO and founder of Rock, Paper, Scissors, a music tech PR firm. Music Tectonics brings you a variety of content examining the massive foundational shifts that are occurring right this minute. Um, the podcast goes beneath the surface of the music industry to explore how technology is changing the way business gets done. And today joining me is the COO of Veritonic, Andrew Eisner. How are you, Andrew? Hey, Dimitri. Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Andrew, you have a background um, in multivariable site testing and content marketing, uh, first with Optimost and then the content marketing is with movable media. Is that right? That's right. And uh, you've kind of taken this idea of site testing and moved it from the, the, the web world over to audio. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. Uh, at, at Optimost, we were helping marketers make data-driven decisions about um, their user experiences on their websites. You know, do I use the green button or the red button? And um, my co-founder at Veritonic, um, he's also a, uh, a, a composer, uh, you know, still composes a fair bit of music on the side. And at the time, you know, he, he and I were both working at Optimost, uh, and his name is Scott Simonelli. Scott um, was always perplexed that the exact same clients that were using data-driven decision, making data-driven decisions for their websites, were making decisions about the audio that they were using in their in their marketing by gut, you know, no data at all. Um, and so that that was the genesis of, of Veritonic. So now. Um, you guys are basically using audio or, or working with anyone that's using audio and getting feedback about what the potential audience reaction could be before they launch into the wild. Um, and that could include voice, music, or sonic brand elements, but elements, but you primarily work on audio ads. Is that right? That's right. So we, we help our clients understand, um, the audio that they're using it, really in, in any channel, but I would say the bulk of our business is audio ads. Uh, if you hear an ad on the radio or streaming or on a podcast, you know, chances are we, it's run through our platform and, and um, you know, the, the marketer is using Veritonic to make a decision about uh, which version or which voice or which sound effects to use in that, in that ad. So this is cool. On Music Tectonics, we talk a lot about the music industry and what kind of technology is making changes in the music industry, whether it's um, just, quote, disruptive consumer behavior or whether it's um, new innovations or efficiencies. But now we're kind of like going into this parallel world that's still about music and technology. Um, but a lot of folks in the music industry are probably not directly involved with audio advertising. So we'll dig into more about what you do and how you do it. But let's step back and talk about trends in audio right now, because I think that's where the connections are. What's What has been the trajectory of audio and marketing over the past decades and where are we going right now in 2019? And then also, is this really about all the innovation happening with streaming and smart speakers as a transition from radio? Um, I'm just curious to jump into that larger picture first. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Marketers were investing in audio um, almost before you know any other medium except for for newspaper, right? I mean, radio has been around long before television, but over time, television got the bulk of of, of marketers' attention and advertising dollars, and then obviously a lot of that has transitioned into into the digital world. But um, you know, audio is really having a renaissance over the last you know, call it three, four years, driven by, I think, a few sort of trends. Some seem kind of silly. Like, for instance, I just think the growth of Spotify and Pandora and Apple Music services like that really gotten consumers' attention, like you said, that 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 quote-unquote disruptive behavior by consumers. And, and people are just paying more attention to the audio in their life than they were, you know, five, six, ten years ago. Um, second, you know, no one could have foreseen, um, the growth of smart speakers and smart devices. Um, but I think that's really just emerged and is continuing to emerge as a, um, as a new interface for the, the, the products and the services in the world around us. Um, and so, you know, those things are just combining to, to make audio much bigger and I, I think have people just pay a lot more attention to the way that their brand sounds 
than they did just a few years ago. And uh, you know, w- w- one other example of that, sorry, is is um, brands. You know, they're not just paying attention to um, you know, the music in their ads, but you know, how does their car door sound when you close it? What sound does a refrigerator make when you open or close it or when it alerts you that you're out of milk or <laughs> stuff like that, right? There's just a very broad way that the products and services that we interact with around us can um, can uh, interact with us via, via audio. Um, and so I, I think that those um, those devices and, uh, you know, th- these trends, they're, they're, they're really kicking in now. Um, and we're starting to see a lot of folks pay attention to them. It's interesting because as you were talking about that, uh, kind of the shift from from radio to streaming, whether it's uh, Spotify, Pandora, or or just smart speakers in general, to me, what it feels like is it's about personalization. Whereas radio was kind of a a one to many format, a lot of the streaming feels like you're able to dig deeper into certain niches that are of your own personal interest. You can't just, you don't have to just settle for a handful of radio stations on the dial that happen to be broadcasting and you either like it or not, but you really hand pick it. And at the same time, the audio you were talking about in devices like refrigerators or even in ads for car doors also feels like it's related to like people wanting very customized personal experience. Not, not necessarily that their refrigerator is going to play a different sound. Like they're, they're not selecting their ringtones for their refrigerator yet. Um, but it does give it sort of that kind of like, oh, my refrigerator makes this sound. Is there a growth in the use of audio for marketing right now? Bringing it back to talking a little bit about advertising. So I think absolutely. If you look at uh, just pure ad dollars, there's a huge uptick in, in the percentage of ad budgets that are going to podcasting, that are going to streaming services. Um, and then I, I suspect, but don't have hard numbers, that brands are paying a lot more attention to the way that their even their television ads or their digital video ads sound because, you know, in, you know, in a world where people are second screening while they're watching TV um, or, or doing other activities during, during you know, ads on the television, um, those really visual ads become audio ads. And so marketers need to pay more attention to the way that their ads sound. And then beyond that, you know, like we've been talking about, I, I think you used a really interesting word before, Dimitri, uh, ambient, as consumers are expecting more of a, an ambient interaction with the devices and services around them. There's more and more, I think, products and services and, and ways we want to interact with uh, our environment that rely on on audio. And so, yeah, I do think that there's a, a big uptick in, in both the dollars and the attention that um, marketers are giving to, uh, to audio in general. That, that was kind of the sense that I got. I mean, even just look, listening to the, the podcasting world and seeing things like Gimlet Media going for $200 million to Spotify and, and, and mm-hmm. everyone getting into the podcasting. Um, it's, it's kind of funny because, because sometimes when I'm thinking about podcasting um, and talking about it, I think about the fact that even in the radio days, early radio days, there was radio theater. <laughs> Yeah, and nobody thinks of podcasting as radio theater, but some of it, some of it really is, and it's it's kind of funny. I think in the face of television and all that video and visual had to offer, radio theater seemed like a step backwards. But now, in the era of personalization and vast user creation and mobility and hearables and smart speakers, audio and and having narrative and audio form only has its has another strength. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And, you know, all all those producers of audio um, that have spent, you know, the past years and decades producing fantastic radio shows, um, you know, those skills are being called upon, not just on the radio, but now across podcasting and these other environments to, um, uh, you know, create, um, you know, engaging experiences. Uh, whether that's uh, in, a, in a podcast or um, you know some sort of uh, ad that goes out over the radio or or you know that you hear on a smart speaker, so yeah, I think that's right. It's it's you know what's old is new again, right? 
<laughs> yeah. Hey, so let's let's dig in a little bit. How how are you going about uh, accomplishing this work of providing feedback on audio assets, whether it's ads or or other kind of audio um, elements? So that's a great question. So so Veritonic is an audio effectiveness platform, um, and it uses a combination of panel data and machine learning to uh, give our clients feedback on on how a given asset is going to perform. So the and by panel, panel data, you mean like focus group almost? It, it, yeah, exactly. It's, I was about to say, so by panel data, what we're talking about is actual human beings who um, will listen to and give second by second feedback in, in, the, in the market research world, it's called a panel, um, like a focus group, um, but typically a little bit bigger. A focus group is typically, you know, just a few dozen individuals and, and we'll get anywhere from three to 600 panelists listening to um, uh, an audio asset to give our clients feedback. Um, and so we're tracking their, their second by second feedback and engagement with those assets. And then simply by virtue of the tremendous number of assets that we've tested at this point, I think over the past four years, um, we've tested about 11,000 different audio assets. The platform is able to identify um, trends in responses to certain sounds and patterns in, in the actual audio file, the, the acoustic signature, if you will of the assets that are being tested. And it knows that, you know, if a certain, if a certain file that sounds this way elicited this kind of reaction from an audience, it was perceived as very happy and modern or sad and melancholy or innovative, or, you know, again, whatever, um, the marketer is trying to accomplish, if it knows that an asset that we've tested in the past elicited that kind of reaction, a new asset that sounds very similar is likely to elicit a similar reaction. Um, and it also looks at, uh, in the case of ads, the actual words that are being spoken, the calls to action and, and um, offers and brand mentions and, and you know, these, these real markers of effectiveness in the audio world and is able to um, make almost instant predictions about how a, um, how a given asset's going to perform. In some cases, that instant prediction is uh, is sufficient, but then we have other use cases where clients need to have, um, they're just used to having panels, uh, you know, actual human responses weigh in on on these assets, and so they'll uh, they'll also pull in a panel to um, evaluate the effectiveness of that ad. So, given that you're kind of making predictions based on past analysis, you're collecting a kind of a data set as your company continues to have more and more experience. So each future client kind of benefits from those predictions. Is that right? That's right. Um, you know, every, every panelist who comes in makes the system smarter. That's right. Um, and helps the platform make better and better predictions about how, uh, it'll respond to that particular set of sounds or how, you know, how it'll be perceived by different audiences, males, females, uh, millennials, for instance. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. And I'm sure you can't talk about specific client situations, but could you give an example of a type of audio asset that you'd be looking at and the types of feedback you might be bringing back to the client? Uh, yeah, well, so we, you know, we talked about this briefly up front, but it's, you know, in many cases, uh, it's entire audio ads, but it's also, we do a lot of work um, helping our clients evaluate voices. Um, do we use a male voice for this ad or a female voice, a young voice or an old voice? Do we hire a celebrity spokesperson whose voice sounds really good to represent our brand? Um, as well as uh, audio logos. We do a lot of work with um, sonic branding. And so those are the types of assets. And the inputs, the, the, you know, the things that the Veritonic platform evaluates, there's uh, really four sort of high-level components. There's the emotional attributes, you know, how well does... Um, the audio actually impact um, the the feelings of the people that are listening to it. I mean, it's, you know, there's a very large emotional component to advertising, and that's what our uh, you know what our clients are trying to look at. Um, there's also um, in many cases they test recall. So how well did an asset um, break through and is remembered by the audience that's listening to it? Um, there's changes in purchase intent. Did they, uh, does this 
asset, and, you know, in many cases, an ad actually make them more or less likely to buy or consider a, a product or service. And then last, but by no means least, is engagement. You know, we, we talked about this before, but, you know, we want to see, do people enjoy listening to it? Are they engaging with it? Is it something they find interesting? You know, these are classic measures of, of advertising effectiveness. And we're, you know, just translating those into the audio world. Wow, that's really interesting. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to uh, kind of bring this into the kind of the music tech world in the music industry. Everyone's talking about smart speakers and hearables, which are basically headphones that you can talk to. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wearables slash headphones. Um, music's melding with podcasts and voice assistants are creating new opportunities for music discovery. I'm curious, are you working with the smart speaker world and how do these directions in voice in uh, voice interfaces impact the work you do? So we do uh, a fair bit of work with with uh, with smart speakers, but you know our clients really consider them simply another endpoint, um, right? Another another channel through which uh, their audio can be delivered. Um, it can be delivered over the air, a terrestrial or satellite radio. It can be delivered via streaming media, and that can be consumed, as you said, through hearable, uh, <laughs> aka headphones. <laughs> <laughs> but also over a smart speaker, you can be sitting at your computer and listening to a, you know, a stream from your local radio station. Um, and, and so I think smart speakers are uh, another way that, um, you know, you, you're just an, an, another, you know, like I said, endpoint that, that a lot of this audio content is being delivered. We, we are actually taking a look on behalf of some clients at the actual, um, if you will, skills, um, or, um, I forget what they're called on the, uh, Google assistant, but, um, you know, how, uh, these brands sound when, you know, you, you, uh, uh, interact with them on, on a smart speaker. So, you know, a lot of brands are at this point content to use the default, um, Alexa, for instance, voice and, um, audio prompts. But I think the more forward-thinking marketers are bringing their audio branding to the uh, to the work to the smart speaker world, so that they sound um, consistent with how they uh, sound in in other environments as well. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about once you get rid of the visual element of the interface how um as a brand you now have to think through sort of how are you being represented acoustically sonically um and even even the brands that make smart speakers or have virtual or voice assistants also have to think through what what the voice sounds like that it relates to the brand how it speaks to the overall brand that's right that's right i mean you know the an audio logo or sonic branding is the audio equivalent of, of uh, a visual logo. And, you know, you go to, um, you know, you interact with certain brands and you know from, from, from start to finish the visual cues they give you uh, that you're dealing with your insurance company or your smartphone maker or your, you know, uh, furniture manufacturer. Um, you know, all these brands as they're, beginning to think about um, how they interact with us in a more ambient fashion. I love that word, by the way. I'm going to keep on using it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, they've got to find ways to bring the same brand consistency into the audio world that they've been using in, you know, visual and other touch points um, forever. And just for anyone who hasn't heard the term audio logo, that's literally like a little snippet that you hear maybe at the beginning and the end of an ad or repeated multiple times at the end of an ad. It's, it's like a logo, but it's an audio form. That's, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, think the, the, you know, the Intel chimes, right? That's one of the best known ones along with like, the, you know, the McDonald's, uh, I'm loving it. You know, it's not quite a jingle, um, but it's a more persistent uh, type of audio cue that you're dealing with a specific brand. I remember as a school child learning music and they use the NBC logo to teach about uh, the fourth step in a scale. That's exactly, dun, yeah. dun, dun. <laughs> That's exactly right. 
the, 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 that's the first audio logo I remember being conscious of. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's a great example. And I, I, you know, I think we're going to see more and more brands. So a substantial number of brands use them already, you know, whether or not we, we, we realize them. Um, but I think that's going to be a more prominent area for marketers, especially consumer facing marketers, uh, to get involved in. You know, I hadn't thought of it, but this podcast, Music Tectonics, actually has uh, an, an audio logo. It's a robot saying you're listening to Music Tectonics. There you go. There you go. That's <laughs> At the right. beginning and the end of the podcast. That's exactly right. So this, all this audio branding stuff seems like it, it um, plays in nicely with music streaming services. How are you guys involved with music streaming services? So we, we work with... Um, you know, uh, I think a, a fair number of, of the streamers uh, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest one, you know, as I mentioned uh, sort of before is, you know, they all to a greater or lesser extent rely on advertising and that audio advertising, um, you know, much of it gets run through the Veritonic platform. Um, we've also, uh, you know, helped various services evaluate other aspects, you know, both audio branding and, um, you know, uh, other audio things that they're considering. One of the, you know, I, I think I can, I can talk about this. One of the, one of the most interesting things we've done uh, is actually, um, well, I'll just say a, a large uh, audio streaming service here in the U.S. <laughs> um, has a roster of about 200 voice artists that they work with on a regular basis to create advertising um, for their clients. And, uh, they actually indexed through the Veritonic platform all 200 uh, voice artists. And the results, I, I think, were eye-opening, frankly, e even for us and, and especially for them. Um, the range of responses, the, 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 the range of scores that uh, the system generated for the different voices uh, was astounding. Um, way, you know, we so the assets they gave us were 200 essentially identical reads, you know, all 200 artists, male, female, young, old, whomever, reading the exact same script. And, you know, I, I frankly didn't expect there to be much variation in the scores. And instead, we saw a tremendous variation in the scores. And what it indicates, you know, is that people have an innate and tremendously uh, visceral response to voice. And so even you and I are reading the exact same script. I, frankly, Dimitri, you'd score much higher than I would, but um, <laughs> don't deny it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, even us reading the exact same script, the audience would respond very differently to you uh, and to me. And, you know, I think we're going to see brands and marketers start to invest more in understanding the voice that they're speaking to their audience with. And, you know, obviously we, we mean that both metaphorically, right? Like the, the sounds that they're making, but, but very specifically, you know, do I use uh, a young voice, an old voice, a male, a female, um, you know, the Southern accent, uh, you know, w whatever it might be um, to, to, again, better reflect their brand. It's interesting. It reminds me of a moment, maybe a decade or more ago when, um, I can't remember the exact time period when telemarketing was really taking off and, uh, before spam bots <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, the companies that really relied on either telemarketing or large, like phone customer service folks were hiring vast numbers of people from the Midwest that they had done research and found that there were certain parts of the Midwest that had the least undesirable voice. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Maybe all those folks are now doing uh, voiceovers. I don't well, know. We were helping one of our clients evaluate um, voices that they want to use for their smart speaker skill. And uh, th this this brand, it's a, it's a European company. Their, their entire product team, um, they all speak perfect, uh, fluent English. Um, but they had selected about 10 um, – U.S. voice actors that they were auditioning, and they again they had them read, read some scripts and, and say a few phrases, and we put them to the platform. And the top performing ones had a fairly neutral accent, um, exactly like you're talking about. And what was fascinating because they were European, we got on the phone with them, and I, you know, I said to them, hey, "Do you guys, you know, 
this is so interesting that the bottom performing voices have this slight, sl slight southern twang or drawl, and they were astounded. They, you know, even though again they speak perfect English, they hadn't detected that in the in, in the mm. in the voice actors. And uh, you know, we we saw those again this wide variation, um, just in you know from a subtle subtle thing like slight pronunciation, slight difference in pronunciation, the audience really reacted very strongly uh, to, to that kind of um, variation. You know, you bring up something very interesting on this topic, which is kind of globalization of media and access to media across, you know, continents and languages. And it'll be interesting to see whether that and, and the data you're talking about and just how people interact and react to, to voices and dialect will change how people talk <laughs> and how people learn English. And I mean, I mean, I know it's, it's true when you're learning a new language, you don't catch all the, or second or third or fourth language, you don't catch all the nuance of dialect right. as quickly. You're just trying to focus on um, vocabulary and grammar and, and, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's pronunciation the specifics of that nuance um, but it but it'll be interesting to see how we continue to navigate um, language barriers as well as dialect um, as more media is shared globally at any given time yeah absolutely um, you know but let's get let's let's go back to music now what what are some broad brushstrokes that you've learned about the impact of music in the in the ads or in the audio logos or any of the other assets have you have you learned anything from veritonics um panels and machine learning reactions to the role music plays uh what what types of music or what characteristics of music work well um so i you know i'll, I'll take that question from, from the marketers per, marketers perspective um i i think what we have seen is that music plays a tremendous role uh in helping to set the mood and um, make a message be delivered much more effectively, um, if you just think about uh, you know any, any frankly any 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 scene you've seen on TV you know if it's playing with clown music in the background <laughs> you'll you will perceive mm -hmm. it exceptionally differently. I mean think about you know the classic scene from Jaws right Donna Donna Donna. If you saw that with any other music, um, even like the Star Wars theme song, it would just not have the same impact. And so I think we see um, and hear examples of that every single day, you know, that the importance uh, of music. And I, I, I'd go even broader, the importance of audio and sound design in um, making sure that, that uh, the audience is, is receiving the message that uh, people intend. And I think, frankly, that's true whether you're talking about a marketer trying to deliver a message to, to their audience or a band delivering uh, you know, a song to their audience. They're, they're crafting a song that um, they want to strike a very specific emotional tone. They want, you know, typically, I think artists, when they're writing a song, they, they have a message they want to send. And um, you know what notes you play and what key it's in and, and all that it, it all contributes to making sure that the audience uh hears the message and receives the message that um that you're trying to send and i think we you know we see examples of that every, every single day you know perhaps um you know almost too data centric <laughs> right but mm -hmm. uh you know intention intentionality in crafting these messages uh is critical are you seeing clients using primarily um, original music for those ads? Are they licensing music? Are they using production libraries? Or do you even know? <laughs> uh, the truth is, I, I, I don't know. Um, we, uh, I, I suspect um, all of the above. I'd be curious if one evokes more engagement or recall or certain emotional attributes versus other although it probably also depends on the specific composition too yeah that's right um although there's one very funny example i saw um I, we actually did, didn't test this ad but i saw an ad on on it, it, it struck such a chord uh no pun intended 
with me a couple of years ago, there's, there's a car company that will go unnamed for reasons that will be obvious in a second. We were watching the ad. Uh, I think it was like, I, I was waiting for a meeting uh, in the reception area of, of some, some company and an ad came on the television. I was there with, with uh, one of my, one of my business partners and um, this ad came on the TV and I'm, I'm listening to the ad and it sounded funny to me. And I looked at him and he looked at me and it hit me at that exact second. It was this company, this very large car company was just using one of the basic loops from GarageBand in their ad. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. That is e either exceptionally lazy or I don't know how that got through quality control. Really? It just, it was just like. Yeah, very, very, very odd. And then that's that's what I mean by intentionality. You know, I, I frankly, I have a lower opinion of that brand as a result. But I mean, some brands have built part of their audio brand on um, actually breaking and introducing artists. I mean, Apple, for example, has always done a great job at curating music in their ads that there are in themselves, the curation of the, of the music with the ad, the visuals and everything. Um, so you identify them as curatorial, even before they had a yeah. music streaming service, they were doing that. Yeah. No, I think, I, I, I think that's right. They, they've paid a lot of attention to, to how their brand sounds and, and these emotional cues that, uh, that, that they want to be associated with. Um, and it's certainly there, there's a lot of other brands, but you know, I, I think, the flip side of that is that the music world has gotten much more receptive to allowing their music to be used for advertising and to associating with brands. And, you know, you're probably more familiar with the trends that are driving that. I just, you know, imagine, you know, the, the, the shift from album sales to, to streaming royalties has changed the economics and the way that um, artists make money. But, uh, you know, I, I personally don't, don't think any less of a, of a, song or a musician if i hear their song in an ad to your point you know that brand may be paying a ton of attention to how they sound and and the the assets they curate to help be perceived a very specific way and i i think that frankly speaks well uh to the music world yeah, I think it probably depends on what the ad is for some creators or, or rights holders and whether they want not to every product with. is appropriate. Yeah, that's <laughs> very, uh, very, very true. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but it's interesting to think about some some brands like a lot of the insurance companies are heavy advertisers marketing both visual mm -hmm. video and audio. And, um, and, you know, they're not known for for breaking original artists, but they have like real earworms in That's their right. audio logos and their ads and the visuals as well. Um, which I think maybe appeals to a very mass audience, but maybe somebody like Apple, for example, is, is sort of saying, Oh, well, if you're this kind of person, we're the right brand for you. That, I think there, there's something to that. You know, the also you, you hit on another point, which is that, you know, insurance companies have invested a tremendous amount in audio branding. Because I think that they have found it to be a very effective technique for breaking through and, and selling what is, in many respects, a, a real commodity service, right? I mean, at, at a high level, there isn't a tremendous amount of differentiation from one insurance company to the next. Um, and that audio branding is a really effective way of, of breaking through, um, breaking through with consumers. Well, that leads us to something I wanted to ask you about. You guys do an annual um, audio logo report that you released in April. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that. What were your findings? Um, what do you learn when you do those? Yeah, um, no, it's a, it's a, yeah, very, very, very uh, appropriate segue. Um, so we, uh, yeah, we, we test uh, the top audio logos in the United States and uh, in the last couple of years, the UK as well. And what we're looking for are trends in the marketplace. Um, what are the, the learnings that we can expand to our, you know, and, and, and share with people? Um, the insurance companies are always at the top. Um, so Farmers Insurance was actually the, uh, the best performing audio logo this year, um, followed by Nationwide. Um, and, you know, <laughs> again, not, not a shock that, that these, uh, these marketers are, um, 
you know, spending a lot of attention with how their how their brands are, are being perceived. Um, I think a, you know a couple of the um, really powerful trends that we've seen. Uh, one is um, brands that use voice and melody tend to perform a little bit better. Uh, that's not going to be appropriate for every brand. Mm-hmm. Um, brands that have a large international presence, for instance, may not want to use words in their audio logo. But you know, the, the nationwide is on your side, or we are farmers. Those are very, very specifically aimed at, at domestic audiences, and so they, you know, they're able to use those phrases. Um, you know, broadly speaking, financial services performs very well, and that obviously includes the insurance companies. Um, the other, I think, really interesting trend that we've seen, and, and Dimitri, you mentioned this earlier, is brands using audio logos in multiple multiple places throughout the ad, not just at the end, but increasingly we're seeing brands use audio logos to bookend their advertising. They'll play it at the beginning and at the end. Um, Honda has been really good at, at doing this for the last couple of years. State Farm started doing that this year. Um and uh, you know we're seeing these ads perform. Excuse me, these audio logos perform better and better over time, uh, particularly with respect to their peer groups. So um, I'm curious where you would like to see the music industry go as it relates to audio. Obviously, not asking you to talk about songwriting <laughs> or composition, but um, but maybe audio ads. I'm curious if artists or record labels should be thinking in a different way about audio as a result of what you know from your work at Veritonic. Um, or even the streaming services. What what strikes you that you could see happening or that, that people who want to lean into the power of audio assets could be thinking about as this well, new Well, you know, from, from an artist perspective, I, I think there's uh, a real need uh, to help, uh, help brands to perform their, um, uh, to create compelling audio experiences. And, you know, I, I think those skills are uh, not broadly diffused enough in the, uh, in, the, in the marketing world yet. Um, you know, we work with a lot of clients who have some exceptionally talented teams. But, you know, again, you've got <clears throat> that car company that will remain unnamed that's using the garage band loop. Um, and so I, I think from an artist perspective, you know, being willing to, uh, you know, work with brands to again create these experiences i think is a, is a huge opportunity um you, know, you mentioned the record labels i think there's also an opportunity for the record labels to um and you know this i, I will admit this may be a little self-serving but you know record labels for the first time ever have access through veritonic for instance to data that tells them how their songs work in different industries with different messages against different audience groups. And I think that, uh, you know, record labels can use the types of data that companies like Veritonic are creating to, um, frankly, go through their catalogs and find audio that, that has not been um, monetized well in the past and take advantage of that in the future. Um, and, you know, you know our, our, our core audience, uh, if you will, is working with marketers here at Veritonic. And, you know, they're embracing this message of data-driven decision-making for audio like they use in every other channel, uh, you know, whether it's television or, or digital. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd love to see more marketers uh, think more holistically about the ways that they can use audio uh, to deliver their messages. Interesting. It makes me wonder. I'm sure the audio logo report is super time consuming every year, but it would be interesting to see somebody, maybe Veritonic, do a, a music for commercial sync uh, survey in the same way, talking about what the reactions were for different musical syncs in advertising. You might as well have the data to show where the value is, what industry. I like that too about what industries um, would be most relevant yeah. for a particular song or track. Could be interesting. Um, so, if people want to learn more about your world or research, where should they go next? Check out uh, www.veritonic.com. Uh, 
Um, they can also download the Audio Logo Index at uh, audiologoindex.com. Um, on our website, we've got a whole bunch of other resources. Uh, you know, I mentioned that audio user experience uh, white paper and you know some other reports besides. Um, and I think that's a great entry point. Great. Awesome. Well, Angie, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I appreciate you taking time. It's fun to dig into kind of this parallel universe with the, the music tech world. And if you are interested in the, the seismic shifts beneath the music industry, how technology and innovation are influencing the industry and um, explore all those conversations, uh, make sure to check out musictectonics.com. We have a conference going on in Los Angeles, October 28th and 29th. If you sign up for our newsletter at the website, you can get a discount to the conference um, in Los Angeles. And thanks so much for listening. Please uh, give us a review on your favorite uh, podcasting app and, uh, and make sure to uh, subscribe so you can keep up with what we're doing on the podcast. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Music Tectonics.